I grew up in Lagos, did a writing software 2002-2003. That's when I met Ezra, we went to school together at Babcock University. Sometime in 2015, I figured out that I could charge a card from my computer, that it was cool. At some point I showed OO and I was like, yo guy, this is a company, this is Stripe. We became the first Nigerian company to get into YC. Our story was very simple. The only way we could describe this that was like Stripe, 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 Stripe for Africa. So many people were asking me, oh, do you want to meet Stripe for Stripe? Like, do you want to meet the real Stripe? <laughs> and we did that. We raised um, a series A, $8 million from Stripe and Visa. Quickly, you have raised $10 million to date, and you just finished your series A, yes. which is at $8 million. Yes. So tell us what both companies are really, really aligned. I think we're trying to do the same thing, help people start and scale internet businesses, increase the GDP of the internet. And I think about how over the next few years, there are going to be bigger exits because now it can be done. Your growth has been, I mean, I think the technical term for it is completely nuts. If one of the most sophisticated companies in Silicon Valley can acquire a company from our ecosystem, like that is just going to unlock a lot of opportunities. This is going to tell people that you can make things and you know and you can like it can work you can build your dreams and you can get it done what would you do if you had all the resources to do it this is my opportunity to answer that question i'm a product guy i just want to work i just want to shape things i just want to build stuff this was the dream and i'm living the dream I think that was a confirmation that you can actually have African founder developing solution and that those solutions can reach a scale that becomes attractive for US large players. And, that, and, and that's a kind of a confirmation in terms of the, the quality of the founder, the quality of the technology. Uh, and it's sometime, some, somehow it's a, it's a recognition for the ecosystem. Paystack was a startup. Uh, looking at the continent, we have uh, power players um, in different regions, uh, M-Pesa in East Africa, MTN in South Africa. What does this deal mean for them? What are the benefits of this Stripe deal? Um, well, I, I have to say that I had uh, most, I mean, like, most of the feedback was very positive. Uh, I think that uh, obviously the founding, the, the founders community was very proud and very excited about uh, what it means, and also uh, it's opening the door also for. It means that other actors in in the U.S. can also come and start engaging with African companies, and uh, maybe we can have other exits happening. And uh, therefore, we had this first thing that was very enthusiastic. I had some very limited um, feedback saying that if uh, that was a, 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 the company was not in Nigeria, it was not in Africa, they would have paid more. So my personal point of view, I think that's a good thing because um, we need to show and demonstrate the, the quality uh, to the rest of the world to attract more capital in Africa. Uh, and and I think that uh, for that's for me the, the most important information that I get from uh, Paystack. Um, we have we become attractive. We have other organizations that are now coming to to look to invest in Africa. And uh, you know, for all the angel investor who are supporting the early stage ecosystem, who are already investing and all that dynamic, they encourage also others to enter earlier. So um, really for me, in that case, I have a lot of positive view. Um, I also think that uh, I could see that, you know, for um, it was for a lot of organization that was really like, uh, you know, not coming from uh, from Europe or really from the U.S. that have built something, etc. So that was really like an authentic company coming here. And... Um, and there's no issue, and there's not the, from my point of view, there's no issue in terms of coming and buying because they're coming and making that grow. And that also will have no, no, an impact on the other company next to them and help them to grow and uh, create market opportunity for them as well. So I think that it's, it's very inspirational for the, the small companies. 
So COVID-19, of course, uh, had a major impact on all industries around the world. Um, how has fintech been affected? Would you say uh, it was badly affected or was there any good that came out of it? I think that it has affected positively. I mean, fintech was already the hot sectors um, in Africa, you know, with the financial inclusion, with the usage of the mobile money. I mean, like, that was really the hot sectors where a lot of investors was willing to go in. But I... I think that what it, uh, the, the, the pandemic, pandemic has brought is that it has brought a consciousness to, you know, from the government. Because uh, until now you had a dynamic from the young entrepreneurs, uh, you know, we had who were sensitive to technology and then say, okay, we want to digitalize this, so don't allow us to scale, etc. But with the pandemic, it has also shown that their technology can be implemented in large infrastructure, should be used by government to facilitate education, etc., etc. So I think that it has accelerated the digitalization on the continent. You know, if you can see, for example, uh, there was always a little bit of trend regarding uh, health tech solutions, but that's also accelerated. And when it comes to the financial in, uh, industry, they also have started to look more closer. They were already looking at uh, FinTech in Africa, but they have started to look closer. You have also now uh, institutional that are, you know, government institutions that try to say, okay, how can we put those kind of FinTech solutions and try to see how we can implement them in our infrastructure, in our organization. So I think that that had a very positive effect on us. Well, uh, if the if the government can really follow up with what's happening, that that is a tough one. But I think that uh, there is actually in Africa transitions where you have more and more new leaders that are coming, uh, who are taking place to understand also that technology and that are more open to it. So I think that it it contributes to the momentum. Um, and you know, for organizations like us, we, we are concerned about the capacity to scale from uh, companies in Africa. We know that in most of the case, it comes from digitalizations, uh, it comes from mechanizations, uh, and therefore I think th this is kind of the area where you have more and more investment uh, VC organizations that are coming. And, uh, and we, I think we, we had, an, uh, despite the, the COVID, we had an, uh, an increase of, uh, of deals in the continent Uh, I don't know. I, I have to say that I think that the news from today is the Flutterway, which is kind of the first uh, unicorn, um, like a re first real own African unicorn. Uh, there's one that I uh, that I like uh, specifically is uh, I'm not investing into it, and then they are like uh, I think that's the, the quite advanced for us, but I like Jane Fifty Four. Okay. Yeah, that's a. a, a they are in fintech, but it's interesting to see that you can have on a continent an organization that is using, you know, high technology, uh, really concerned about, you know, how, I mean, like, it's not something very basic, it's very sophisticated, and I think that it shows the quality and the, 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 the competence existing on the continent. We're bringing women's voices to the conversation and more than that, we're building a community of inclusion and empowerment. Here in Kinshasa, campaigns to raise awareness against the spread of coronavirus are common, but getting that information to people who have no access to water, electricity or money 
can be a challenge. We are here at Kalerwe Market in Uganda, Kampala. We're in this whole market. Women are crying out for their situations to change. For women, it will be better for us. I think a big thing for me is just being able to say that when these protests are happening, uh, does it turn around into policy? Our kids are raped every single day. This movement got the government to listen. It really was powerful because it showed what is possible when men and women band together and say enough is enough. It's not necessary anymore to climb on a car. I can be in any place to cheer with the people. been with us and there's been a lot of uncertainties about it and I'd really love to say MPESA has come in so handy. As you know, COVID is a matter of cleanliness and once we are handling a lot of cash, there's, the risk is very high. So you find that people really try to embrace the MPESA and still trying to embrace MPESA, even if the public service vehicles, eh, they have embraced that till number. And we continue to, even as passengers in those vehicles, we continue to tell them to give us till numbers and means of paying not to handle cash because Many a times when you handle cash, you go greeting people. We, know, we are not even greeting currently. But you see that phone transaction is helping us cap down the, the transmission process of that COVID. So I think it's the best solution. And even if COVID, the, 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 there is a solution to be found, I think the MPESA transaction should still continue. We should now stop the cash transactions and continue with the MPESA transactions. It was so strong and it is still so strong currently, even now. In fact, I, even as we are talking, I don't have cash. I use, even paying other things, I use M-Pesa, money I use M-Pesa, and payment is easier that way. So I prefer M-Pesa than the cash transactions. Me, I can say, the customers are still using M-Pesa as before, like when COVID started. It's still the same. Because it has uh, helped in STEM, to stem the, how may I say it, the spread of COVID-19. Pesa kwanza imesaidia vizuri, manake hiyo cash enye mtu anashika shika. Pesa has helped a great deal because there's no direct contact with cash. You make transaction using the phone. Because when one coughs and covers the mouth using the hands, the money can be contaminated and help in the spread of the virus. So the spread of the virus is minimized. Anashika shika mahali, so hiyo spread ya virus kidogo ime, ineza nini, ineza saidia. PESA is a technological um, in, innovation in itself. You know, when the pandemic just broke out, we had a lot of talk about, you know, don't do cash transfers, you can do them online via M-PESA. And so in that kind of sense, then you see technology again coming to save the day. And so I think, yeah, uh, M-PESA did see a good, uh, a great year when it came to the uh, global pandemic. I was glad to have M-PESA during the pandemic for safety reasons, because money, the exchange of hands, that's how we transfer drums. So having uh, that electronic method to avoid that process was, yeah, it was really, it helped the mind. Personally, I think M-PESA was strong, especially because they considered the fact that since most of us are going to be using Git, they would need to reduce the rates to cater to different people and our, you know, our financial abilities. So, yeah, I think it was strong. We are very proud to be the first company to be issued or given this license, the first mobile money license in Somalia. And this truly means that Somalia was cashless society before, but now it's officially recognized by the government and the international um, system, monetary system, whatever the, 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 the financial systems, as, our, as a system that can be relied on uh, fully complied 
and uh, can compete with the rest of the world, and that will ensure more trust from the international business and what they call partners to trust our digital payment systems and more and more partners to join us to make Somalia a better place. And what do these regulations entail? What exactly does it mean when we hear that your company has been licensed by um, the central bank? Before the system was there, uh, it was ensured by, it was, it was a self-regulation before. What, that, what does that mean? It meant that uh, the money that's on, on the system was uh, packed by the, our company's deposits in our own other bank. But this has changed. Um, whereby now the Central Com Bank of Somalia comes in, they take the deposit, they held the deposit, equivalent or more than the money that's on the system. What that means is there will be uh, a guarantee from the Central Bank that no money will be lost or can be lost within the system, the digital system, EVC system. And that's how the license is given. And we, we complied with all the requirements to fulfill these criteria, and now it means basically more trust for the, for the customers, more trust for the international partners and NGOs who want to, to use our digital payment system, and uh, we are fully licensed company, a digital system. And for Somalia, of course, uh, there's been a lot of use of the U.S. dollar uh, in circulation, um, mobile money, all that cash. Uh, what does this mean for the shilling? Do you see um, it being able to be used within um, your mobile money app, allowing people all around the country to be able uh, to participate in using digital money? The Somali shillings has been in a, in, a, in a bad situation for the last few years. And the confidence of using the Somali students has been growing low and low to the extent that some uh, business vendors will reject even using it in some areas. So that can be reversed by the central government, hopefully, and that's what they're planning. The payment digital system that we have prepared, technological wise, is ready both in dollars and in Somali shillings. So we have been using for the dollars for the last few years, and if the government comes forward and says, well, this is the time to use in shillings, we are ready and go. We are ready to go. Do you think that this will increase your subscribers or users um, that will join in now that there is this regulation? Certainly, yes. It will give customers more confidence to trust what company we are and who we are, and it will ensure more smooth running within the businesses because the shilling, the dollars, and the trust, uh, the international partners who were afraid before to use, especially the international NGOs, will be more than ready to trust the system and add more money and without uh, fearing or having that anxiety of, of not regulated. For years now, Zimbabwe has faced an acute shortage of cash that has forced people to switch to mobile money. An informal sector is booming in exchanging foreign currency for the local currency, or in some cases, the other way around. The process is known as RTGS, or real-time growth settlement. So people prefer to use the RTGS for easy movement of, of doing their business. Yeah, so that's why they are preferring the local currency in RTGS form. Also, it has a better margin uh, when they get it uh, from, the, from the streets. The process is profitable for traders, and some people have left their formal jobs, such as teaching, for it. It's a hassle which is technically criminal. That's why some do not want to be identified. Zimbabwe's currency is worthless. That's why people, even those formerly employed, come to us in the streets looking for foreign currency. That's how we survive. In a statement to VOA on Monday, John Panone Samangunjga, governor of the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, said he was happy with the current setup where around 80% of the country's transactions are conducted electronically.
He said, our goal is to see Zimbabwe becoming a cashlight society where at least 90% of the monetary transactions are conducted through electronic products that include plastic money, mobile banking, internet banking and electronic transfer, he said. But not everyone agrees with him. In this era, you want to go 100% cashless. But you need to be very careful when you look at statistics. What we are celebrating at 80 and hoping to get to 90 may not actually be a success story. So people still need cash to the extent the electronic money itself is not yet fully acceptable to the transacting public. Chundu said that's why people often take their local currency the moment they have it and exchange it for US dollars or South African rand to preserve its value in case electronic cash becomes unworkable or is declared illegal. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News Harare. You know, what we're trying to do is connect the unconnected. You know, in Africa, statistically, 70% of the population are still not connected to the Internet or still not using the Internet. That's a huge number. If you look at business today, e-commerce, digital money needs Internet. All these Internet business are focusing on the 30%. And that's the challenge. Everybody's focusing on the 30% of the population that is connected, the middle class, you know, uh, or, or lower middle class, but there's 70% of the population not connected, and that's where we're focusing on. Civil servant Ruth Oladimeji signed up with Money Point, a mobile money service on whose behalf she helps customers with services such as opening accounts and withdrawing cash. That was in May last year as restrictions on movement were relaxed after around two months. Oladimeji has set up six kiosks in her community in just under a year and in a country where most people live on less than $2 a day. She said she earns more than 60,000 Naira, $160 every day. It has increased my standard of living, it has made my family, my, that is my daddy's side, my mother's side, it has given me much respect. So it has, been, it has helped me to be able to, to support people financially. Mobile money firms across Africa are ramping up plans to bring banking to millions of people across the continent. After the coronavirus pandemic caused a surge in use of digital financial services, firms in Nigeria say they have ramped up the number of agents to meet the demand. Solomon Amadi, vice president of Money Point, said the company's banking agents had increased from 8,000 in 2019 to more than 50,000 in February 2021. Demand has increased because of the influx of people coming into agency banking. And with that demand, we've literally grown like 900% in the industry. We've had like $3.9 billion in transaction revenue processed since the pandemic. And then we've also grown our agents by, I think we have around 50,000 agents now across the country. However, the preference for cash is deeply entrenched in Nigeria, with long queues into the banking halls, 
unserviced money dispensing terminals and imposed COVID-19 safety protocols, many are unable to visit traditional banking institutions, tagging it tasking and time-consuming. Engineer Taiwo Joseph has been visiting an agent for seven months for his financial services. I like coming to an agent because it is very close to my house. And I also don't like going to the bank because of the crowd. And ever since when I've been using this agent, it has been very, 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 their service has been very, very good. Standing in a roadside orange kiosk featuring a sign with bank logos, Oladimeji's thoughts have turned to offering more services. As I see myself, so I've developed into a microfinance business. So I'm still doing my agency banking, but I, I, um, I, I believe it would have grown to that extent of being a microfinance, maybe in a, local, in a locality. If microfinance in the locality helps people to finance, getting their daily savings. Financial experts say there has been a steady increase in digital and mobile financial services driven by the pandemic and success of fintech firms such as local startup Paystack, which was bought by U.S. payments company Strip for $200 million last year. Reporting for VOA News, this is Mike Ove.